Happy Friday, everybody, and it is another episode of the Between the Ears show here presented by Sports Illustrated Mountaineers Now. I'm Skylar Callahan, and it, hey, look, we are officially under two weeks away from kicking off the 2022 season up at Acrisure Stadium between West Virginia and Pittsburgh. It's hard to believe. It seems like it's been a, a very, very long offseason, but we're finally here. We're getting ready to turn the corner and get this thing started. And I've seen a lot of, I guess, low expectations for West Virginia this season, and rightfully so. They've lost a ton of talent um, via the transfer portal, graduation, and there's a new offensive coordinator coming in in Graham Harrell. And there's some question marks at key positions, in, including quarterback. Even though JT Daniels is coming in, we know about his health and how very little he's been able to play throughout his college career. So there's been a lot of doubt about this West Virginia team. Um, so today I wanted to flip the script because I, I know a lot of people probably think that I'm uh, very down on this team or I'm, maybe I'm just pessimistic, but I, I'm very realistic in my expectations and my, my view of this team. I do see it as like a six, seven win team. Um, I think this is a team that is going to kind of resemble that 2017 West Virginia team, if everyone stays together, of course, where they figure out how to play together, they how, they figure out how to win together. And next year, which would be kind of like resembling 2018, where they, they really take that step and they start competing in the Big 12. So I don't think that's bad. You know, I don't think that's a bad situation, um, again, if everyone returns. Um, but that's a big, big if, especially now in today's climate of college football. But Greg McElroy, if you haven't checked out uh, one of our recent articles that we put up, he actually listed five teams that on his podcast, Always College Football, that you don't want to mess with this upcoming season. One of those five teams was West Virginia. And... He listed about five, maybe six different bullet points as to why the Mountaineers are dangerous. And I got to say, he's he's pretty accurate on all of these five or six points. You you have a coordinator who has an identity, which he didn't really bring break this down, but he just talked about the addition of Graham Harrell and how the, the implement um, of him implementing the air raid at WVU with this offense, with these playmakers, could could do a lot of good. But to me, it was not just that, but the fact that this team has an identity offensively. We haven't been able to say that for the last three years. And I don't think it's, you know, a knock on Neil Brown at all. But he has been able to, now he's been able to kind of take a step back and have kind of oversight over the whole team rather than just the offense. So I think that's going to be a big thing. Having Graham Harrell there is going to not only help elevate this offense and the efficiency of the offense, but it's also going to help elevate Neil Brown as a head coach, not just on game day, but throughout the week in preparation as well. So Graham Harrell, big addition. JT Daniels was the next thing that he talked about. And again, if he is healthy, yeah, he's probably one of the better quarterbacks in this league, maybe the top two or top three quarterbacks, along with Spencer Sanders uh, at Oklahoma State and maybe whoever else you want to throw in that mix. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if, if, he's, if he's healthy, this team's got a chance to do something special. The offensive and defensive lines are very experienced, as, as Greg McElroy talked about. Anytime you bring back all five on the starting line, that's a big plus. But for the for West Virginia, this is essentially two years in a row where they're bringing back, you know, four or more guys on that starting unit. So these guys, even though they've played a lot of ball together, um, you know, I think some situations it's it's almost kind of like, yes, they're still they're almost still inexperienced. Um, that's the one thing I kind of would take away from it. Um because you look at this offensive line, Wyatt Milam was a true freshman last year. He's only in his second year in the program, second year at this level. Brandon Yates is flipping over to the right side. You don't know what that right tackle battle is going to look like, whether it's going to be him or Jaquay Hubbard. Um, Zach Frazier's entering year three, so you do have some stability there at center. James Gmitter has been around for a while. Doug Nestor's only in his second year in the program. So even though 
these guys are all returning. They've all had multiple years or most have had multiple years under their belt. Still kind of a fairly inexperienced group in terms of working together. So I'm interested to see if that's really going to be that big of a factor or if they're going to be as good as advertised and that's going to be one of the strong units of this team and maybe helps keep JT Daniels healthy for the first time in his career. If that does happen, again, West Virginia could be in the mix um, for the Big 12 and maybe more. The weaponry that JT Daniels is going to have. You know, obviously he's had a lot of talent with him at USC and at, at Georgia. But for for this offense in particular, you know, you look at how this offense is going to be ran, and that's going to be by throwing the ball, you know, potentially 30, maybe upwards of 40 times a game. You have Bryce Ford, you have Sam James, you have uh, Reese Smith, uh, Caden Prather, um, you know, Jeremiah Aaron, Cortez Bram Jr. There's a ton of guys at receiver for this thing to work. And I think to have a, a efficient air raid offense, you have to have five to six guys at receiver that you can trust and also have a couple of backs that you can trust to catch the ball to the backfield and also run the ball, keep things fairly balanced uh, to some extent. When you look at some of these air raid offenses that had, say, two or three just kind of dominant players, and there's a huge separation between those top three to the next three, it, it it's not going to pan out well because obviously teams are going to start heavy – you know, heavy loading their covers for one area of the field. They may start double teaming. They may have a safety over top of a corner in that direction of one of those two receivers. There's a lot of things defenses can do to take away a, a, a main player of an offense and sometimes even two. But if you have five, six different guys that can, you know, maybe not equally spread out the wealth, but if they can all find a ways to be, find a way to be consistent and find you know, a way to, to impact the game, then it's it's going to help you not only on a week-to-week basis, but it's also going to help you down, you know, later in the season when we get to November and December, uh, you know, when, when your depth is going to be tested. There's going to be injuries that pop up. There's going to be inconsistencies that pop up. Uh, there's going to be a lot of things that you're just not expecting to happen that could happen. There might be a transfer or two, especially, again, with today's college football. So, I, I do think there's enough talent there at wide receiver. There's enough talent in the running back room with Tony Mathis, Justin Johnson, C.J. Donaldson Jr., the freshman that's that's kind of catching everyone's attention, Jalen Anderson. The talent's there offensively. Defensively, I'm not – personally, I don't think there's anything to worry about. Now, I know Greg McElroy said in that video that, look, the back seven's got some issues. But I, I don't think he has studied – the back seven enough to really understand. He's looking at what's come back in, in that front, uh, in that front group with Dante Stills, Taj Olson, so on and so forth. But I think they've actually improved, not only in the second level with the linebackers, but in the secondary too. The secondary is a huge question mark heading into this offseason because you lost, you know, a couple of guys at safety in a corner, and then you lose Daryl Porter Jr. and Troy Fortune to the transfer portal. So it looked at one time like this was going to be a very, very weak, uh, not position group, but unit of the defense and weak area of the team was that secondary. They bring in Rashad Ajayi. They bring in Wesley McCormick. They bring in Jalen Shelton. These guys have all played college snaps, albeit at a lower level. But they're, they've been very productive at everywhere at, at their respective stops. They're experienced, they're productive, they're going to step in right away and make plays. Plus, you got Charles Woods. You got Charles Woods, he's maybe the best corner in the Big 12. You bring in Lee Koba at linebacker, gets them more athletic, more uh, gets them more speed on the field, gets them bigger in the middle as well. Lance Dixon's a guy that everyone's talking highly about at, at uh, fall camp. So, to me, yes, is West Virginia a dangerous team? Absolutely. Is this a team that's going to be, you know, threatening to get into maybe a New Year's Six type situation or a college football playoff bid? Uh, you know, I, I don't know about that. Um, 
I think that's obviously that that would be a dream scenario, but I think that would be getting ahead of ourselves. I think this is a team that at its best probably wins nine games. And I said this on Wednesday's show when we talked about the the ceiling and the floor uh, for this team was, was Zach Campbell. I think nine wins is their ceiling. Now, can things happen to change that? Absolutely. Um, maybe the rest of the league isn't as good as I think it's going to be. Um, maybe Baylor takes a, take, takes a step back, which I'm not expecting to happen. Maybe Oklahoma falls way off, which I'm not expecting to happen. And maybe Oklahoma State um, losing all that talent defensively, maybe it actually does catch up to them, which, again, I'm not expecting to happen. So those three teams, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, and Baylor, if any one or two, maybe even three, all three of those teams take a major step in the wrong direction, it's going to open things up for not only West Virginia, but the Big 12. So, yes, West Virginia is dangerous. They have the talent to compete this year. It's just about how quickly it can all happen. Again, you got to go to pit week one. There's no cupcakes. There's no tune-up games right out of the gate. It is pit in the backyard brawl on a Thursday night in Pittsburgh, September 1st. It, it's going to get real very fast. Then you got, again, I know it's Kansas, but you have Kansas week two, a Big 12 opponent. You can't, you know, look past them for any reason at all. They're going to be a much improved team under Lance Leipold. And you get to week three, you got Towson, that's your tune-up game. And really your, your only tune-up game, your only cupcake game on the schedule. And then you get Texas, Baylor, and so on and so forth. So it's going to, it's not an easy schedule, especially at the, you know, at the beginning of the season, that first half of the season, those first five, six games are going to tell a lot. If they can get through those first four at three and one or better, then you like their chances. But again, it's still going to be more challenging once you get to Texas, Baylor, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Kansas State, who I think is going to be really good. So is this team dangerous? Yes. Is this team going to be more dangerous in 2023? 1,000%. I, I don't think it's even a question. This is not a year where it's contend for the Big 12 or bust or New Year's Six bowl bid or bust for Neil Brown. It's not. Um, is it, you know, a situation where if they go five and seven, then yeah, he, could he lose his job? Yes, I, I do think so. There's no, there's no sense or feeling right now that Neil Brown's on the hot seat entering the season. But as I've said before with, you know, with Zach and, and Eugene Napoleon, Chris, uh, that have all been on the show, I think Neil Brown could easily coach his way onto the hot seat by winning four or five games with this team. There's just there's too much talent for this team to only win four or five games. However, they can win six or seven, and I still think he's safe. I just think you have to show that you're competitive, even in your losses. If they go seven and five or six and six, and there's a lot of close games, a lot of one possession losses, then sure, that's that's a whole different story. But going four and eight with this team, that's not going to happen. That's, it's just not going to cut it out. It's just not going to cut it. So, um, I, but I think this is a great foundational year for Neil Brown, for this program. And if they can just find a way to get to seven wins, like, which is my prediction, or more, they get to eight, maybe, surprise people. If they get to nine and really surprise people or have their dream season of 10 and two, then you're you're setting up for potentially the biggest season in West Virginia history. I would say, I mean, maybe one of the biggest seasons in the last 20 to 30 years. 2018 was a big one because of all the talent coming in or all the talent coming back. Um, we saw how that played out. The 20 or the 2017 was rather good. The Geno Tavon years were good. So. This, this could be one of those seasons in 23, but it's got to start here in 2022. You've got to create a culture that knows how to win, an atmosphere of winning. You've got to be able to create that so that when so that way when you get to the 2023 season, the, the standard is set. 
that this is what the, the benchmark is. This is what we've got to do to get to a Big 12 title. This is what we've got to do to get to a New Year's Six and maybe more. It can happen in 2023, but it's all going to start with this dangerous team that Greg McElroy says here in 2022. I'm Scala Callen. This has been Between the Years. We'll be back here next Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Don't forget, we're going to have Eugene Napoleon's Relatively Sports on Tuesday at 6 p.m. Follow us on Twitter at SI underscore WVU. You can follow me on Twitter at Callahan underscore. Also, make sure you hit that subscribe button so we can continue to keep doing these videos every Wednesday and Friday on YouTube. Check us out, Mountaineers Now. Eugene Napoleon and I will be actually doing our first The Walkthrough Game Day show next week, previewing the 2022 season. And then the following week, we'll have our game preview with Pitt. So that's going to do it for today. And I'm Scala Callahan with SI's Mountaineers Now. We'll be back here next Wednesday. Take care.